This afternoon, I preach to you God's word as we find it summarized in the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 35. This Lord's Day deals with the second commandment, which reads as follows. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. And then we confess in Lord's Day 35, what does God require in the second commandment? We are not to make an image of God in any way, nor to worship him in any manner that is then he has commanded in his word. May we then not make any image at all. God cannot and may not be visibly portrayed in any way. Creatures may be portrayed, but God forbids us to make or have any images of them in order to worship them or to serve God through them. But may images not be tolerated in the churches as books for the laity? No, for we should not be wiser than God. He wants his people to be taught not by means of dumb images, but by the living preaching of his word. Thus far, our confession. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the first and second words of the covenant or commandments are closely related They both deal with our basic relationship to God. And yet, although they're closely related, they are distinct. They are different. The first word of the covenant is, no other gods before me. That is, have no one but the Lord as God. He is the only one that you must serve. The basic meaning and intent of the second commandment is different. It deals with the question of how. How do we conceive of this God, the only true God? How do we approach him? How do we worship him? How do we go through life with him? For all of life should be a life of worship and adoration for his mercies and salvation. And so this commandment deals with images. We can therefore say, how do we picture this God so that we give him glory and honor that is due to him. Yes, how do we picture him so that we can go through life with our God in a life of worship that is acceptable to him? So that is the heart of this commandment. And the Lord's directive is, make no image of me, says the Lord. So let us consider what the Lord our God means with this. So our theme for the proclamation this afternoon is that God prohibits the making of an image of himself because, first of all, he does not want to be made according to our image. And secondly, he does desire to make us to make us according to his image. Why did the Lord our God forbid Israel to make an image of him? One reason that scripture gives is that God is spirit and he cannot be represented by way of an image of Israel's making. After all, when Israel was at Mount Sinai, Israel did not see God. They only heard his voice. And therefore, God says in Deuteronomy 4, Take good heed to yourselves. Since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, beware lest you act corruptly by making an image for yourselves in the form of any figure. The point is clear. God cannot be seen. 
and so don't make an image of him. However, more is involved. If we are to fully appreciate the intent and the point of this commandment, then we need to consider the place and the purpose of images in the ancient world in which Israel lived. An image was extremely important in heathen worship. An image was therefore made very carefully, either from stone or wood or special precious metal, and so it was carefully crafted. And after this was done, the image that was made representing their God underwent a whole process of consecration so that the dead material of wood or stone or metal could become the place where the God in question was, dwelt. In this way, one wanted to ensure that those eyes of the image could see and that the mouth could eat and that the ears could hear. So pagans believed in the power and efficacy of their images. And so an image that was consecrated became the dwelling place of that particular God. And so the image of a God was in the ancient world the place where the deity, where the God was localized. The image represented the concentration point of the powers of the God in question. That image, that's where the God was. Via such an image, the God was therefore in a very real way within the power of the human maker, even dependent on man. Indeed, the gods who were made according to the image of man in human form, these gods needed to be clothed. They couldn't do it themselves. The priests were consecrated in order to clothe these images. These images also needed to be fed. And so elaborate meals were prepared and the food was placed in front of the god twice a day. The priests would come after a couple of hours to eat the leftovers. They ate very well. These images, these so-called gods, were in every sense of the word dependent totally on man's care and in man's control. And not only were they clothed and fed, these images were also taken on trips, boat rides, hunting. The god in question was totally dependent on man. This also means, on a more sinister basis, that they could be manipulated to suit human wishes. And indeed, unscrupulous priests manipulated these gods to suit their purposes. There's much evidence of that. Yes, such a god, made by humans, consecrated by humans, fed and clothed by humans, was totally in the control of those who made them. And so the god's power was thought to be concentrated and localized in that particular image, totally reliant on man and in man's power. Now against this ancient Near Eastern background in which Israel lived, God told his people, that's not gonna happen in Israel. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. And so in this commandment, the Lord God forbade any making of images. That is, he forbade any attempt by human beings to take hold of him and to localize him in a piece of wood or stone or metal. No image must be made of the true God and manipulated for man's purposes. God is sovereign Lord who is free to do as he pleases. As the psalmist says in Psalm 135, whatever the Lord pleases, he does. 
and he does not need to receive food and drink from his people as if he depends on it to counter such thinking, such false views of worship. The Lord God said, for example, in Psalm 50, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the whole world and all that is in it is mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? The true God cannot be reduced to an image so that humans can handle him and can use him. Oh no, for a start, how would you even picture this God? As we read those stirring words from Isaiah 40, to whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. His understanding is unsearchable. The Lord, he is God. And this God cannot be compared with anything in creation. He's eternal, he's sovereign, he's omnipotent. To make a graven image of him, to even attempt it, is to deny his sovereignty and almighty power. Yes, one could even say to make an image of this God is to act as if human beings came up with the idea of God and that he could bind God to himself. Actually, man making an image, making his God, puts the whole business upside down in more than one way. For it was not man that came up with the idea of God and then bound such a God to himself as the heathens did. No, in the beginning, God made man and woman and revealed himself. In the history of his people, the Lord repeatedly revealed himself. Here I am, my people. This is your God. The Lord God stooped down from heaven to do that. He revealed and bound himself to his people of mere grace and love alone. He, a sovereign God, did that of his own free choice. He, the Lord, made his covenant with them. It was God's idea, his work. And when considering this commandment, we have to be mindful of that covenant relationship. Yes, we have to abide by his revelation. Only in this way does one get a correct picture of God. Only so does one realize what a very humble place we have over against our maker. A God who cannot be manipulated. A God who cannot be pictured to suit our purposes. Indeed, only in closely listening to what he tells us in his word can we begin to have a proper understanding and picture of God, the almighty, sovereign God of grace? Only then, for if we rely on our own insights and ideas of what God is like, if we are to come up with our own image of God, then we would come up with a very distorted idea indeed. Think of Israel impatiently waiting at the foot of Mount Sinai for Moses to come down. They were afraid that they were being abandoned by Moses and maybe even by God. And so they wanted to make an image of God to make sure that God would not desert them so that could, they could clutch on to God and keep him close by. And you know, when they wanted to make an image of God, the best they could come up with was a golden calf. That's the best they could do to represent their God who delivered them out of the land of Egypt. A rather distorted picture of God, to be sure. God cannot be measured or represented by man and pictured by him. God forbids it because man's picture and image of God would always do grave injustice to who he is, sovereign covenant Lord. Now the images and pictures of God that are forbidden do not just include physical images of wood, stone, or metal. 
When the second commandment refers to these type of images as the worst sort of image making, there is also included other attempts by self-centered man to picture God and to make an image of him that suits his purpose. Think, for example, to take a historical example, the image of God which Judaism and the Pharisees made for themselves. They constructed a picture of God who in many ways was like a super accountant, constantly busy checking the credits and debits of life's balance sheet. The Pharisees put God in the service of their view of the law of earning salvation rather than listening to God and putting themselves in the service of God's thankfulness for the salvation given. So they manipulated God. They fashioned an image of him which was far from a true reflection of who God is. They, in this way, bound the people, the church of those days, in servitude to a God who was not the God of Scripture. The Roman Catholic Church has also constructed and still constructs similar images of God, which lay behind all the images and superstitions in that so-called church. A picture of God is then made which serves man's purposes and which is determined by man and not by God's word. Pictures and images arising from a sinful creation and bound by it. They should have taught God's people by the living preaching of the word which directs men to the living God and not to serve images. Now, when you stop for a moment to think this through, it becomes more and more clear that this commandment also has a lot of relevance for us. Even though we don't have a golden calf, and even though we reject the image-making of the Roman church, our hearts are also by nature inclined to evil, inclined to making images of God which are not biblical. So the question we must therefore ask ourselves in all honesty is, could we be picturing God in such a way that he's more suited to our purposes rather than being scrupulously faithful to how God reveals himself in Scripture. So what sort of an image do we have of the living God? Is it an image that enables us to use God for our own ends? You know, it's very easy to do that. The world has made God irrelevant. They've pushed him aside, the unbelieving world in which we live. And if he exists at all, he is for the world just a sweet old man who is all love and will never punish. But what kind of a picture do we have of God? What kind of an image do we take with us through life of the living God? One of the greatest sins of the church has been to try to manipulate God and to use him for their own advantage. That's the sin that lay behind the golden calf. It ultimately lies behind Roman Catholic theology. But let us be careful of any image of God that we may have or that we may construct that denies his sovereignty so that we feel comfortable with him and so that it's more useful for us. Let us remember that God is God. And he cannot and he will not be manipulated by us. And therefore, this commandment calls us to self-examination. Could it be that we too sometimes have a wrong picture of God? For example, a very simple example, taking God for granted and saying, well, of course, he will never leave us. He'll never leave me as long as I show up in church and go through the motions of being Christian. That's a false image of God because God looks at the heart. He doesn't just look at our outward behavior. 
Are we still in awe enough of this God, the creator of heaven and earth, who has come down to us of mere grace and who in spite of our unworthiness has included us in the covenant, has embraced us in Christ? You know, God owes us absolutely nothing. For of ourselves, we deserve only his wrath. But in seat of sovereign grace, he has created an unbelievable relationship with us in Christ. And now he calls us to respond with a love unending, a love from the heart in a life of holy worship. It can happen that people get angry at God because they think that God should answer their prayers exactly the way they want their prayers to be answered. They want God to play according to the music of their own fiddle. And then when that does not happen or when the unexpected disaster strikes, such people say, where is God? And they even can lose their faith for they had always had the wrong image of God as a God who only blesses and only blesses and only gives good things who never, ever puts his children to the test. They forget that God will provide within the covenant relationship as they wish. But they forget that God says, just trust and obey. And even when disaster strikes, I'm still there. And I will work it out for good. But be patient. I am sovereign Lord. I will carry you through. And so we must be very careful not to construct an image of God that suits our expectations and that we want blessings when we want the blessings and that when God sends disaster in our lives, we do not give up, but that we admire his sovereignty and say, Lord, give me patience. Give me love for you. Our God is sovereign. He cannot be boxed in by our expectations. He cannot be controlled by our thinking of how our life should develop. He is sovereign. On the other extreme, we can sometimes think of God as being too small. As one who's only worried about our soul so that we exclude him from virtually all the rest of our life because we think he's not really interested, or worse, because we think it's none of God's business what we do during the week. That's my business. No, that's not how God operates. That's not a true image of him. Because when God enters our life, he does so as covenant Lord, and he wants us completely, nothing excluded. He does not want us to submit to him part way, but he wants to share all of life with us. He is also a God to whom we can go with whatever difficulty we have. Don't think of God being too small. He is big. He has a huge heart of love for us. And he will listen to whatever we bring to his throne of grace. Nothing is too difficult for God. Only the decision of how our prayers should be answered is God's decision alone. And then we have to pray for the grace of God to receive what he gives us. More examples of wrong images and expectations of God and pictures of him could be given. But the point is clear. The point is that the Lord takes this matter of how we view him very seriously. Our God earnestly hates all warped views of himself by which we try to make God serve our expectations or needs. And therefore, the question that the second word of the covenant raises is, whom do we worship? The God of Scripture or the God of our imagination? God is God, sovereign Lord, and he will not be bound by images of our making that we delude ourselves into thinking that it's a true image of God. And therefore, as parents, for this commandment mentions parents, therefore, as parents, we must be very careful what kind of an image of God we project to our children 
by our attitudes, by our walk of life, by our prayers? Do we live in awe of the Holy One of Israel? Do we convey the sense of the greatness and majesty of our sovereign Lord to our offspring? The point is important because this commandment even has an addition which involves the place of parents and children because God says, don't make an image of me for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Parents are warned in this commandment. They have enormous responsibility for their children with respect to this commandment. Indeed, parents have much influence in molding the minds of their children on all sorts of subjects. And so the question is, what picture are we giving to our children of God? Can our children tell from our lifestyle and actions that our God is for real and that he does truly exist and that he's with us day by day and that he's not just an empty article of faith? Can our children tell from us as parents that God is the living God, holy and awesome in majesty, who hates all sin? Do they recognize the God of Scripture in our life? Do our children see from our struggle against sin that we worship a God who has saved us of grace alone and that we are so thankful that we want to give our very best to him? Can they tell from our life that God hates hypocrisy and half-hearted service, but only delights in a life of total commitment and thanksgiving, a life of prayer, of living close to God? Can our children see from our lives as parents that we live in worship and reverence of him, the Holy One, who has shown us such love in Christ of mere grace? In other words, are we getting the God of Scripture across to our children? Or are they perceiving some warped image according to our own sinful desire to make God fit our needs so we can manipulate him consciously or unconsciously? Such questions are urgent because this commandment reminds us that God is jealous for his honor. The commandment even goes to the extent of telling us that he visits in wrath those who picture him and make him different from what he is. And so this raises another very important question. Who of us, let's be honest, who of us is able to do this commandment perfectly? Who is able to pass on to the offspring a true image of the God of Scripture, a true reflection of God's glory? So there's no misinterpretation of who God is for our children. Are we by nature not bound to mold and picture God from our own sinful, creaturely perspective? Is it not natural that we conceive of God in terms of ourselves and our desires and our small view of life? Who is able to give a true picture of the God of the covenant, the God of love and the God of wrath, the God of jealousy and the God of mercy? Well, the answer is obvious. Not a single one of us can do that. It is impossible We cannot project to our children of our own account a true image of God. We're unable. But what we cannot do, God can do. And God does it. For God could not and cannot tolerate man's making graven images and false pictures of God. And therefore... God desiring to show what he was really like, to show his people graphically what he's really like, he sent the Son who truly reveals God. For the Son is the express image of the Most High. 
as we read in Hebrews 1, verse 1, or verse 3, he, the Son, reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature. Or as it says in Colossians 1, verse 15, Christ is the image of the invisible God. Or elsewhere in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, it says that Christ is the likeness of God. Through and by the Son, God told what words as such could never express. In sending the Son, God showed man the true picture of who God is, what God is like, what God is all about. Then in Christ was evident God's love, God's justice, God's holiness, God's jealousy, all these revealed as never before throughout the entire Old Testament dispensation. In Christ crucified, we stand in awe of God's hatred of sin, but also of his jealousy for his honor and justice and love for men and women lost in sin. There in Christ crucified and resurrected is the true image and picture of who God is. And not only in his dying and resurrection, for also in his entire earthly life, the Son showed and revealed the Father. He who has seen him has seen the Father. In his ministry, the Lord Jesus showed how God, who is holy, desires to be worshipped by us. Christ submitted himself totally to the Father. Your will be done was the guide for his life. God was everything for him. He, the Most High, had to be glorified. And so Christ's life was a life of submission and prayer. And in so being with men, he showed them the true nature, the true picture of God who desired such obedience. As we ponder how Christ did this commandment perfectly, showing the true image of the Father, we also begin to see how he fulfills it and has also done this commandment for us in our place. And then we see the grace of this commandment even more clearly. Basically, God says to us, look, don't make an image of me. You can't do it. Your picture of me will be distorted, the Lord says. It'll be twisted beyond recognition. You'll lead your children astray. God forbids us to make an image of God. For not only are we unable, but more importantly, God forbids it because God wants to make and remake us as his image so that he can be properly regarded and worshipped by us and our children. We're not to make an image of God because God wants to make us according to his image. And it's possible because God has revealed his image in Christ for all to see. It is possible because of Christ. And so we are not to mold God according to our thinking and desires. That leads to disaster. Rather, he is to mold us and shape us according to his likeness and desires in Christ that he be glorified. In this way, lives which are by nature sinful can be changed into lives of worship and praise, reflecting the glory of the Lord. As God first made man in his own image in the very beginning, he now recreates human beings, young and old, he recreates them by his word and spirit, and he makes us his image in Jesus Christ. Christ, who is the true image of God. Surely, this is the miracle of the love of our God. 
He makes us, you and I, his image so that a true picture of the one holy God can be present here on earth and so that God can truly be worshipped and glorified. And then others can see through our life and lifestyle something of God, of what he's like, something of his true image as holy covenant Lord and Redeemer. Now then, are we getting the right picture across? In Christ, it's possible to be a true image of God, to be a true image of God in our homes and in the world around us. Yes, it's possible because it's all part of God's work of salvation in our lives. It's his work as he molds us and shapes us by his word and spirit. And the catechism rightly mentions the scriptures. They are very important in this context for it's precisely in the reading and listening to the scriptures that we become molded into God's image, that we are shaped and influenced by the desires and wishes of the Most High. Only by a constant interaction with the scriptures through the power of the Holy Spirit do our sinful pictures of God become replaced by the true image of the God of Scripture, the sovereign Lord who cannot be molded and shaped by sinful human beings, the God who has taken hold of us to make us his image, the God who wants us to picture before others the beauty of the Lord, his love for sinners, his hate of sin, his grace, and his wrath. When our Lord God so mercifully shapes and molds us as his image, then our life is saturated with the spirit of Jesus Christ, who is the express image of God. And then God's image is seen in us, and then God gets his due and is glorified. And then our life is a life of worship and communion with God, a walking with him in the deepest and most beautiful sense of the word. And then the second commandment becomes more and more a word of grace and a word of hope in a life of gratitude and worship. For we more and more realize God's grace in forbidding us to picture God according to our own sinful insights and wishes. He forbids us so that God can show himself in Christ and show picture to us who he really is and so that he can also shape and mold us according to his image. And then even our lives can picture something of the reality and glory of our God, that he be worshipped and praised and magnified by us. Oh, may that be a reality in our lives, so that others too can see how great our God is who has come to us and who has transformed us in his image. Amen.